We have clients that say, I mean, what percentage of clients come to us and say, I'm filing bankruptcy because my credit is terrible and I want to buy a home at some point. Oh, a good number of them. A good number. If, just in the world of Chapter 7, it's well over 50%, right? I think there's a higher percentage of people who already own homes in Chapter 13. But I always like, I just want to go off topic just ever so slightly. With those folks, I always say, let me give you a little speech. Home ownership isn't magic. It doesn't build well. You have to be prepared for it. You have to do your research. You have to save up money for a down payment. The less you put down, the more that house costs. And so if you can save up 20 grand for a down payment, you're well ahead of the guy who's using the 3% first time home buyer thing. Hi, this is attorney Jamie Miller, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of the Miller Law Chronicles podcast. And today we have bankruptcy lawyer extraordinaire and soon to be married to Matt extraordinaire <laughs> in the next couple of weeks is Deborah Stencil. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. So it's very exciting to get married, and I, I know that you are a uh, a wonderful bride to be and tell us how excited you are about that. I am very excited. I did not think I cared about this ceremony all that much, to be honest, but the joy that it is bringing the people around me, including Matt, has convinced me that it actually means something. So it's exciting. It's exciting. Yeah, that is, it's a wonderful thing. I think you guys have been together for long enough to know that it's we're beyond the time like is it going to work or is it not going to work you know it's going to work right and marriage is a good thing and i think one of the biggest things about marriage is both people getting the other person and do you and matt do you feel like you get each other oh yeah i love that we've been together 12 years and we can still sit up after work and talk for three hours about whatever. We still, you know, and we laugh all the time. So even though we have divergent interests in some ways, we still have things we do together that that gives me a lot of hope for the future as well. No, that's, that's so great. Thanks. It's a, uh, many of our listeners probably don't know that you're in your spare time when you're not a bankruptcy lawyer, that you're a, a comedic actress actor i'm sorry there you go very and, good i love it <laughs> and, and uh, i had the privilege of seeing you do some improv this past weekend which was remarkably funny thank you and w what i thought was interesting is that there was two shows the first show you were not a participant in and the quality of the show was, show was really good and then the second show included you and it got even more funnier if that's a word, you really brought a level of humor that I really thought the second part of the show was just really good because you were part of it. So I, you, you, Nick. you think on your feet so quickly and you just say the funniest things. <laughs> One of my favorite things is you were guys doing uh, the improv where we were talking about people's cereal, favorite cereal, and you took a twist on that and you <laughs> turned it into like, a series of, you know, <laughs> instead of serial, you were thinking serial TV shows instead of serial Fruit Loops and that type of thing. I thought that was brilliant. So good job on that. Is that something you're trained you. to do as you're training for improv or is that something you just like is in your own, your own head? I think that's my style that I like to do humor that is more unexpected and surprises you and like a pun that is a dad joke, that's fine. Those are enjoyable, but I like to take them just a little more twisty, sometimes a little darker. Right. So for instance, it, I wasn't even thinking of serial TV shows. I was thinking of serial murders. Um, right. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Got it. But yeah, so I think improv training is more about relaxing and enjoying yourself and trusting your partner and learning to be open to possibilities 
and then your own personal style helps you, you know, just develop your personality on stage. Right. Yeah. That's right. When you were training for it, not to totally kind of just go on a totally different topic, but when you were training and you were like in improv school, was that as mm. fun going through that process of learning as it is performing? Like, was that fun? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Classes are amazing because sometimes it's people who want to be comedians and sometimes it's just folks who want to try something new, who want to get out of their shell, who want to get out of the house or they have to do public speaking and they thought, oh, this will help me get over that fear. So we often have engineers and lawyers and other folks who just need to speak in their daily lives and they use it as a way to learn how to do that. Right. Yeah. And, uh, there's a whole thing about applied improv where they go into businesses and teach people improv games to help them be better business people. Oh, so. Well, talking about business, let's mm. get down to business and talk about our topic of the day, which I really want to talk about the dramatic increase in housing prices and how it's impacting all of us in our community and Milwaukee, the state of Wisconsin, but really in all of the United States, there is just this housing crunch and post COVID and inflation that has really increased the price of rents and mortgages and purchasing the cost of purchase real estate so much that it's impacting the bankruptcy world, but it's impacting the lives of so many. And I'm, I'm curious, have you come across that in your bankruptcy practice with your friends of people talking about, I can't afford rent. I can't afford to buy a house. What, what are you seeing out there, my friend? I'm seeing it in a number of ways. Unfortunately, I think for retirees on a fixed income, maybe the house is paid off. So you think, oh, they're unaffected, but guess what? Their tax bill is now bigger. And so now it's less food on the table because the tax bill is so much bigger. Some people who should be in a chapter seven might struggle to qualify because exemptions are only changed every so often and they're not keeping up necessarily with the inflation. And then interestingly, if I file a, an adversary for a student loan, so if I try to help someone get rid of their student loans after the bankruptcy is over. The government still looks at the value of their home. And some of these chapter sevens from two years ago, the house value is so much bigger now, it's impacting their ability to get rid of their student loans. So, Right. And I think what we're kind of getting at is that, you know, the increase in housing costs, whether it's a mortgage payment, whether it's a rent payment, is really forcing people to struggle that, you know, at some point, you know, if you're renting an apartment for $1,500 a month and you have a car payment, you have credit card debt, you have medical bills, and you are trying to meet those obligations. And then all of a sudden your rent goes up to 1600, it goes to 1700, or you have to move and then it goes up to 1800. What we're seeing in our bankruptcy world is that you know, housing is a critical thing. And so mm -hmm. when housing prices go up, it results in reduced disposable income, which right. in turn impacts people's ability to pay their ongoing debt and causes people to fall behind on that car payment or fall behind on their credit card debts, which will, you know, reduce, which could reduce their ability to pay, but also increase their need potentially to file bankruptcy when two years ago, when their rent was 25% less or the mortgage payment mm -hmm. was 25% less, they weren't having that problem. And right. wages are not increasing at a rate similar to inflation. Wages are going up, but inflation has been going up and housing prices have been going up at a higher rate. And so that has just been you know, when clients come in and see us and say, I don't know what happened. I have same bills. I have the, the same wages. I have the same job and my rent's going up. 
and now I can't afford to meet my bills. You know, during COVID, it was so rough because people weren't moving. And so anyone who needed a place to live was having trouble finding a spot. So I imagine there's still some hangover from that as well, that part of the rental market got to jump its prices quite a bit. Just an observation. Yeah. And you were talking a moment ago about exemption laws and protecting your assets. And so home values are going up. In Wisconsin, you're an individual and your home has 75,000 of equity in general terms. You're able to file bankruptcy and protect that home. And so what's happening to people now is, you know, a year ago, two years ago, you may have had 75,000 of equity in the home. You could file bankruptcy, but because of that home value going up, the ability mm -hmm. to file bankruptcy is now gone. And you may have to do a chapter 13 mm -hmm. results in, you know, an, another payment. So how in the bankruptcy world, other than exemption problems, because home as home values go up, it makes it more challenging to protect people's homes in bankruptcy. But how else has increased home values, increased life of clients you're seeing in the bankruptcy world? Well, I think you touched on this a second ago, but if you can't afford your rent, you can't afford food, but your credit card, which you generally can't pay rent with, it's generally difficult. You can use it to buy food. So people are juggling. So people are juggling more. And that means there are going to be people filing bankruptcy in two years because they're suffering now. And of course, credit card debt is unsustainable. It grows and grows and grows. And unless you win the lottery, you're not paying it off. And, you know, interest rates have been so high since 2020 that makes it even doubly precarious to use your credit cards for necessities food and, you know, gas. So as those balances grow, they're more likely to end up in bankruptcy. Right. So if someone filed, you know, two years ago, they, their house was worth 75,000 and they owed 75,000. There's not an equity issue, but let's say their home is worth 150 mm -hmm. and they owed 75. The mm -hmm. Wisconsin laws allow them to say, you can, we're going to give you the privilege of discharging your debt and you can keep that first 75,000 of equity in your home. So someone right. can file bankruptcy house is worth 150. They owe 75, that 75,000 of equity is theirs. Now we have increased housing prices and sometimes, you know, people will come to us you know, in 2022 and says, I have $30,000 in credit card debt. And we'll say, you can file bankruptcy. Your house is 150. We can protect the equity. Then things change, their job change. They come back two years later. And all of a sudden that $150,000 house is now worth 175,000. They still owe 75. Presuming that the homestead exemption 75,000, they have like 25,000 in equity. What are you going to tell them about the issues with doing a chapter seven? What happens there? And then what happens? How do you look at that equity when it comes to a chapter 13? All right. So the, the issue is if you cannot cover the exposed equity with an exemption, like in your example, worth 175, I owe 75. So there's a hundred thousand in equity. All I have is 75,000 to use. There's 25,000 exposed. If that person were to file a chapter seven, she would be at risk of the trustee asking her to, well, telling her to sell her home. So the trustee could take that 25, pay off the mortgage and give our client her 75. So that's why we talk about your house before you file a seven and we look at the values. Now, before I scare her too much with that conversation, I will ask her, Hey, if we did a closer look at your house, is there anything wrong with it? Do you need a roof? How old is the furnace? Do you have mold problems that might pull that value down into an area where we can deal with it? If there's nothing like that, then we're talking about a chapter 13 where she would pay 
that $25,000 in equity over an extended period of time, which makes it easier for her. She gets to keep her house, but it's still fair to her creditors. I mean, that's the point of exemptions, right? Yeah, you get to keep so much. Everybody gets to keep enough, but there's a line somewhere where if you have too much stuff, maybe your creditors should get some money. And so that's the fairness aspect of it. But that's why there's a 13. You don't have to lose your home. If you have a job, you can afford to pay something, then you pay something over a period of three to five years. Right. And very helpful. That's very insightful. And I know we're, we're dealing with that a lot with our clients. And then the other thing is, you know, we have clients that say, I mean, what percentage of clients come to us and say, I'm filing bankruptcy because my credit is terrible and mm -hmm. I want to buy a home at some point? Oh, a good number of them. A good number. If Just in the world of Chapter 7, it's well over 50%, right? I think there's a higher percentage of people who already own homes in Chapter 13. But I always like, I just want to go off topic just ever so slightly. With those folks, I always say, let me give you a little speech. Home ownership isn't magic. It doesn't build wealth. You have to be prepared for it. You have to do your research. You have to save up money for a down payment. The less you put down the more that house costs. And so if you can save up 20 grand for a down payment, you're well ahead of the guy who's using the 3% first time home buyer thing. And then buy the littlest house you can get away with and still be happy. I just try to push that on people because I think folks go into those houses not understanding. I know I didn't understand the first time I bought a house what it really costs. But anyway, that was my tangent. Did I answer your question? Yeah. What percentage? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we see a lot of clients, they, their goal is to, you know, file bankruptcy, get back on their feet, rebuild their credit. It generally will take, you know, 18 to 24 months to rebuild that credit score. And right. that time comes, they've filed bankruptcy, they've cleaned up their credit report, they've got their judgments reviewed, removed, they've done our seven steps to 720, their credit score is up to 720, we're two years post bankruptcy. And sadly, they find themselves in a situation there's not a home out there that they can afford to buy, which is just so eternally frustrating because, and that's why people are renting today so much. Right. Because right. the cost of home ownership, it's not just the mortgage, it's the mm -hmm. taxes, it's the maintenance, it's the upkeep, all mm -hmm. of, it's the insurance, all those things. So when you factor, mm -hmm. oh, I can have a $1,700 mortgage payment or I can pay rent for $1,700, that's not comparing apples to apples because that $1,700 for home ownership is probably really $3,000 and that $1,700 is probably $1,700 or $2,000 if you factor in, in utilities. But the, the bottom line is housing prices are going up and we need to do something about it because it's outpacing the ability to for people to afford housing. And what once was a starter home, you know, that people could afford, we had that, you know, when you and I were at that age of buying our first homes, there was a starter home. You could do it now. Today, there aren't starter homes. Every what you would perceive to be size-wise as a starter home is far more valuable or costs more than an average person earning a really good mm -hmm. income can afford. Right. And I'm very fearful of what the future of home ownership is going to look like for, you know, for our kids, you know, going forward. I think you have an excellent point. My dad and his wife have lived in what we call a cop and teacher neighborhood on the western side of Milwaukee. And they've been there since 1980. And so they're just small, one story, sort of square, cute little houses. And the neighborhood is aging, so people are passing away or selling their homes. So there have been a number of sales on the block in the last year. And these three-bedroom, one-and-a-half-bath, 1,400-square-foot homes are going for two fifty, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000. That is not a starter home. <laughs> and we don't live in Chicago. This is Milwaukee. That is not right. But I think there might be some good stuff coming. I think one of the reasons why 
it's really hard for our clients to get a house right now is that interest rates are bonkers. The prime rate was eight and a half percent for what, four years? In 2020, the prime rate was 3%, slowly or quickly climbed to eight and a half percent. And it stayed there for at least the last year and a half. It, they just have started to chip away at it. So like on Monday, the prime rate went down to 8%. Not a huge drop, but they don't usually drop hugely. They go up and down in halves of a percent. So I'm hoping that as the interest rates fall, more people will be able to afford a mortgage because 1% on a mortgage over 30 years, that's a lot of money, <laughs> right? So right. I'm hoping that will stimulate the economy, even out those housing prices, and more of our folks can afford their dream homes. Right. And while they're waiting, they can save on their up their down payment. <laughs> right, right. And you were mentioning it earlier, is be careful not to get sucked into that dream home and say, you know what, screw it, we'll figure it out because you just can't say that. And I, you know, one of my favorite quotes when it comes to, you know, insight on what house to buy is, you know, some people are looking for a beautiful place or a place that fits their needs, but others make whatever place they're at beautiful. So it doesn't matter the size. It doesn't matter the neighborhood. It matters that you feel safe in your home, where you live and what you do in that home to make it the place that that works best for you. So when you're out looking for that shiny new home or that shiny new apartment and you may not be able to afford it, don't just go at it blind and say, screw it, I'll figure it out. Because if if you have to say that, it could come back and bite you. It really could. Well, I appreciate you doing this podcast with me today. I thought we really got some valuable information out there. And if people like this podcast, which I know they do, because our listenership continues to climb, I would ask you to subscribe and like Mm -hmm. and find us on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, on Apple Podcasts, on... And then, of course, you can watch us. Get the button on, on YouTube. YouTube. And you can find us on the iHeart app as well. Oh. So very excited. Thank you. Great talking to you as usual. Okay. Talk to everyone soon.